This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hey, this is Enoch, and welcome back to the Business of Architecture, the show for solo architects, where each week I bring you an interview exploring how you can leverage your skills as an architect to make more money so you can forget about paying the bills and focus on creating great architecture. Hey, just a quick word before we start our show. If you're a solo architect and you do residential architecture, I want to invite you to a webinar put on by Business of Architecture at the end of this month about how you can use automated web tools to generate real leads with your website. I'm going to be presenting some case studies of other architects have done this and also step-by-step -step instructions about how you can implement some of these strategies with your website. The address to sign up to claim your spot is businessofarchitecture.com slash webinar. That's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash W-E-B-I-N-A-R. And now on with the show. Hey everybody, this is Enoch from Business of Architecture. Welcome back. Today we're joined by Matthew Siegel. He's the COO at Jonathan Siegel FAIA, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the development projects he's working on right now down in San Diego, as well as a project he developed, the Fancy Lofts. So Matthew, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be on. Yeah, good to have you on. So tell us a little bit, first of all, um, about what you're working on right now at Jonathan Siegel FAIA. Um, right now, we're actually working on a project in uh, an up-and-coming neighborhood in San Diego called North Park. It's a 27-unit apartment building, uh, of which two are affordable units uh, for very low-income families. And then there's uh, five commercial spaces totaling somewhere in the uh, five, 6,000 square feet, square foot range. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the neighborhood of this project. Give me an idea for where it's at, kind of why you guys chose this, this, this location, and what you think about this particular project. Um, so basically in San Diego there's the downtown area and then there's these um, pockets around downtown that are slowly uh, gentrifying and becoming more um, uh, more likely for people to want to live in that typically wouldn't want to live in those areas. People that are, were living downtown now are moving out of downtown because these areas would be typically less expensive, easier to get in and out of. Um, and there's a, a newer base of restaurants and, and outdoor activities that they can participate in. So is, are you guys the first to break ground with this kind of project in that part of town? Um, actually, just before us, another group, uh, Mike and Craig, um, form, Architecture and Form, uh, bought a post office uh, probably about six blocks away, and I think they broke ground before us. But there have been some pretty nasty large-scale developments in the neighborhood, which uh, inadvertently actually helped get the neighborhood to where it's at, but kind of destroy the texture of the neighborhood. So I, I can't say that we were the first people in that neighborhood. Okay. And is it, was it a teardown? Is it new construction, adaptive reuse? Um, it's a teardown. Uh, there were a series of buildings on the site, and I use that term buildings pretty loosely because we were afraid they were going to fall over before we even got a chance to demo them. Um, there was a, a lady selling antiques, um, and when I say antiques, I use that loosely as well. Um, there was a house in the back and a, a couple other shacks where people just had their home offices. Um, it was a strange environment, but basically tear down, long-winded. Okay. Tell me about the process of locating this property. Were you involved in that in that process of doing the pro forma, figuring out the numbers? Yeah. So we had actually been interested in this property for a long time, and the lady that had owned it, I, I can't remember how long she'd owned it for, but uh, she was asking. I think probably 30 to 50 percent more for the property maybe two years ago. And it's kind of this, uh, this crossroads. It's at the southern end of North Park um, and this really important intersection that we didn't really understand at the time and now we understand how important it is. So it, it ended up being pretty fantastic. But uh, basically, it's a, I think it's a, I'm going to get this wrong, I think it's a 30,000 square foot piece of dirt. Um, and it's a strange short, a sort of L shape with a little tooth coming out of it. Uh, in the southeastern corner, there's actually an sdg &E transfer transformer station. Um, but basically, it's this L form that has a lot of street frontage. I think there's 300 feet of frontage. Wow. 
Now, I know some places they, they, the impact fees will kill you when you're on a corner lot like that. Did you have any issues with impact fees? Um, no, I don't, I don't think anything in San Diego has any sort of corner lot implications for impact fees. Um, we were actually able to get credit for the existing buildings, um, which was helpful, and uh, as far as water credits, et cetera. Um, but no, the, the biggest impact was actually there was a complication with parking. Um, in this zoning area, you're only allowed to park residential parking on the rear 50% of the lot. And because this lot was... I can't. I'm, I'm blanking all these dimensions, but let's say it's 75 feet deep. That only leaves you 30 feet to actually park residential. If you go in the the long section, and if you go in the opposite section on the lower part of the L, again that that leaves you sort of a strange segment. Um, so we were able to use incentives from the in low income housing to offset that and reduce our parking requirement. Nice. So because you guys have those two low-income housing or affordable income housing units in the mix, you're able to get away with less parking on the site. Correct. They give you, in San Diego, they give you one incentive for a single unit and then uh, for two units, or it's actually a percentage basis, but um, it's so many percentage they give you two incentives, and that's the maximum you can have. And that's applicable to anything within reason. You have to provide a reason why because you're providing those affordable units that you're, you should be allowed to do these things. But it, it really ends up helping in certain okay. circumstances. So what was the process? Did you guys have to go before the planning commission? How much of this was discretionary? It was entirely discretionary. Um, I'm sorry, ministerial. Uh, we didn't have to go by anybody. It was by right that we were allowed to build 27 units. And um, I think the cutoff was actually 33 in that zone where you had to go through. Awesome, awesome. Well, you know, I think the what you're saying now brings up two very important points for other architects who want to do their own developments, and that is the first one is that you can look at things like affordable housing to get credits, right? You mentioned that. Yeah. And then another thing is you mentioned the credits that they can get on the impact fees from already having an existing building on the site. Correct. And I don't know if that's nationwide, but in San Diego, if, if you have a house or you have square footed commercial, that's applicable to impact fees. You know what? That's in my same area here too, and I'm not like you said. I'm I'm not sure if it's everywhere else also, but are there any other sort of little freebies or or creative things that you guys have found to help get these projects off the ground? Um, that's a good question. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't really think of anything. Um, the the key is just to keep it below that threshold of having to go through the the public planning process, the public approval process. I think that's the biggest freebie. So when you're actually calculating your project out to make sure that you fall below that threshold, whatever it is in that zone. So typically that's the first thing we look at. What's the max amount of units we can put on the site without having to go through the public process. Okay, and then what determines whether it's a go or no go? After you take a look at the units that you can put on the site, what happens next? Um, well, we run our performance to make sure that the land cost is uh, uh, a safe number, um, and also our construction vi construction loan viability. Uh, will the bank actually loan on this property um, and loan on the construction? And we'll typically do a preliminary review with the city. We'll draw something up really quickly with a, a basic scheme. Take down this, I think in San Diego, it's somewhere between $350 and $750 to have multiple disciplines review it. Um, and at that point, once we get that back, uh, we've also been con or concurrently getting a soils report, et cetera, if we feel that there's a more often than not, or more likely than not, um, possibility of us actually developing the site. There's a lot of things that actually end up being concurrent at that same time to, to discover the viability or the, the possibility of actually doing this deal and making it um, profitable. What can you tell us about what the banks are doing right now in terms of loans? Were you involved in that process at all of financing the project? Yeah. Um, so we've actually developed a couple. Well, my father has developed a couple relationships with banks um, for permanent financing and for construction financing. And um, some, depending on the, the amount of commercial, some will loan it and some won't. Um, so that's something else. If 
if somebody's doing a development, you want to make sure that you have uh, under their threshold of commercial relative or proportionally to residential. Um, so one of our banks likes it to be, I, I can't remember the figure off the top of my head, it may be 15 or 20 percent uh, maximum for commercial and the other bank will do a little bit more because they're not um, a publicly traded company. So there's a little bit of leeway there where they have some flexibility to yeah. negotiate. And and uh, honestly, the biggest I think the biggest thing is just maintaining those relationships with banks once you have them. Um, we have we use California Bank and Trust, which have been fantastic. We use them on our previous deal. They're uh, very easy to get along with. They're understanding. They get what we're trying to do, um, and they'll they'll definitely take into account the a lot of things that maybe a national bank wouldn't. Um, sort of the design aspect, increasing the rent costs. Because they underwrite all this stuff, and um, the likelihood of a national bank realizing this up-and-coming neighborhood can actually support a $2,200, $2,400 a month two-bedroom um, may be less likely than a local bank that you have a relationship with or you actually um, have worked with before. Sure, and sort of kind of gets the vision of what you guys do and how the revitalization of the neighborhoods are coming along. Yeah, exactly. Whether or not they even live in that neighborhood, um, just just talking to people and having that, that comfort of understanding that is really helpful. Yeah. Any any sort of gotchas in this project so far? Um, where is it at, first of all, in the process? Um, we're actually uh, topping out the, uh, when I say topping out, the concrete portion of the project. We're doing, um, it's all on-grade parking. All of the cast-in-place walls on the ground floor have been poured. And we're now putting shoring in and finishing up our slab on grade. So um, we're hopefully pouring our first raised decks on Tuesday of next week. Okay. So are we talking a podium slab with parking underneath for the entire L shape? What does the sort of shape of the building look like? You know, it's complicated to explain. Um, I don't know if you can add a, a video, or I'm sorry, a photo to this video, but um, essentially. Let's do that. I'll, I'll cut it in. I'll cut it in, Matthew, as you talk yeah. and explain it. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, basically, it's an L shape, and the entire street frontage is glass, um, and the ground floor, wherever we can feasibly, is commercial and glass. Um, and then on the interior, there's actually a courtyard building. It's it's one interconnected building, but in the courtyard, there's a a separate building where we're actually putting our new, we're moving our office into. So pretty exciting to to be designing our new office. Um, we're kind of in a temporary situation right now, and it's. Uh, it's not as much fun to be there as our previous offices have been. Um, but basically, there's a tuck under parking. Um, there's a garage in the back. Uh, and there's courtyard parking. So we tried to keep it as open as possible. And where we couldn't, we, uh, we made tuck under or naturally ventilated parking areas. Yeah. You know, one thing I've noticed, too, about your buildings is that they've sort of progressed over time. And I noticed your firm has experimented with different volumes, different shapes, different materials. Any new any new experiments on this particular building? I don't think we've ever done a concrete podium deck before. And my first building that I built uh, when I got out of college was the Charmer. Um, and that had a wood podium deck. And because of these expanses that we want to have in our, our volumes um, without any structural breaking points or, uh, or conflictions, we had these massive beams that just became so complicated, so expensive, and so time-consuming to set up, um, and all these steps and everything that we decided that the concrete is a better product, um, both for the, the underside, the commercial units, as well as um, speed, time, and just efficiency-wise. So okay. that's a first for us. Okay. And just out of curiosity, what kind of construction is the raised concrete slab? Um, it'd be type 5 rated. Yeah, so type 5 construction. And then is it is it cast in place, um, flat slab, monolithic flab? Is it? Um, I'm curious, um, down in Texas, we used to do the post-tension slabs a lot for those kind no, of construction. No post-tension. Okay. Um, we, we actually fortunately didn't do that on our, on our cube project. I wasn't around for that, but had we done that, it had been very difficult because any time you have to core, or anytime you have to penetrate, you have to x-ray the slab. So that's something we try to avoid. And also we've had um, situations uh, with friends that have done it um, that you actually get deflection um, a lot more than a typical just normally reinforced slab. 
Gotcha, gotcha. And it, it can be thinner with post tension, but in these circumstances, it ends up being less expensive and, and easier without the post tension. Awesome, good to know. And so when you talk about the open spaces, that's down in the commercial spaces? Correct. Have you guys pre-leased any of those spaces down there? Actually, we've leased all but one of them. So there's our office, um, fantastic place uh, in our previous building called Influx that's going to do a cafe. Another um, restaurant in our previous building called Underbelly that's doing a noodles and, and yakitori. Um, my dad's best friend's opening a taco shop, like a street taco shop in one of the little spaces. And then, That sounds uh, nice. It's going to be very cool. Um, kind of a hip street taco shop. Uh, and then the last space we're hoping for a, a breakfast or a fish restaurant. We're just kind of waiting and choosing. Nice. You know, now I can I can start to understand why your guys are excited about this new office space. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's been very fun. It's gonna be a lot of nice cuisine there. Yeah. Are there any other commercial spaces or restaurants in that area? Yeah, it's actually um, it's a big nightlife area, and there's some fantastic restaurants too. It's it's becoming the new restaurant area in San Diego. Very cool, very cool. What do you guys do for marketing to pre-lease these spaces? What can you, what insights can you give us about marketing Call a friends. project? Call our friends. <laughs> I don't, you know, we're very picky and we have a certain design for, um, philosophy or, or um, requirement that we mandate with all these people and that needs to be hip and it needs to have some, add some vibrance to our building. So that's what we focus on. And if we don't like somebody, we just wait. I mean, it's, uh, at some point we can't, but for the most part, by starting the pre-leasing before we even started construction, allowed for a, a variety of people to, to figure out if they could financially make sense in that neighborhood. And we're getting outrageous rents, too. Awesome. Well, you, you mentioned that at first when you guys looked at that property, you didn't realize the key aspect of it, how important it was, but now as you're in the product, you're seeing that. So what did you mean by that? How is this particular location so great? Well, it's strange when it was the antique shop and those other strange little shops, it didn't have any sort of uh, anchor for that neighborhood. And because this is the main intersection of how you get into the neighborhood from the south, um, from both the southeast and the southwest, uh, the the traffic that goes by, you just feel it. Um, and now that those buildings aren't there, you, you feel it even more. Um, you really notice it. So it's on a thoroughfare. Yeah, it's basically the gateway into the into North Park from the south. Excellent, excellent. Now, for people that are joining us for the first time, Matthew, tell us a little bit about the history of Jonathan Siegel Architect so people can sort of get an idea of your firm and, and get a flavor for what you guys do. Yeah, so uh, essentially it's my, my father's firm, my father and mother's firm. Um, I, think it, I think it was 1992 they started their firm. Um, I think he's done 20 buildings in downtown San Diego, um, prim pretty much only downtown San Diego, and he only works for himself. He doesn't work for clients. Um, my parents both, they they buy the property, they discover the property, buy the property, develop the property, and then my mom and now my sister also run the management company. So it's all in-house from start to finish, and we don't sell any of our products. So it's a true blue family operation. Yeah. And then where can people go on the web to see the work of your firm? Um, JonathanSiegelArchitect.com. That's uh, S-E-G-A-L. If you search Google, you should be able to find it. Or if you'd like to see the apartment website, SDLofts.com. Um, but Jonathan Siegel Architect should be able to direct you to everything. Nice, nice. Last time I heard Jonathan talking about the prices of construction starting to go up a little bit, a little bit more competition in the local area. What are you seeing on the ground in terms of the the construction prices and the availability of contractors and the overall general mood? I mean, is now a good time to build? Um, you know, for the most part, it seems as though everybody's swamped. Um, and the prices we got specifically for plumbing were dramatically higher than what we were seeing two, two and a half years ago. Um, I think framing is kind of stabilized, uh, although lumber is going back up. We, we were just fortunate to be able to lock in our lumber at I think a two-year low, so it saved us quite a bit of money. We have a fantastic framer um, that framed my little project. Uh, what else? I think concrete's kind of stable, but again, it, it's hard to find. There's so much work out there right now that it's hard to find somebody that's willing to take a little bit less money or, or uh, a little bit less profit 
and take the job. They they'd rather you know start to build up their their big profit jobs again. And I, I definitely feel that um, there's a labor shortage and there's a lot of work right now. Interesting. So I guess if there's any skilled laborers out there, head down to San Diego. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear for Californians because we've been suffering for a long time, and so it's good to finally hear that there's some stuff being built now. Yeah, everybody keeps telling me that they're just swamped with bids, and it's not bids that are future projects that aren't getting built. It's bids on projects that are starting, so it's it's very good. Excellent, excellent, Matthew. You've you've had a number of con conversations with your father about about getting an architectural license, mm -hmm. and I know in the past that you sort of you know, or at least your father kind of recommended people not to get a license if they want to be a developer. So I'm curious if you what your thoughts are on that and your your future path if you want to get a license or what your thoughts are about the trade-offs. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I think the only reason I would get my license is for the respect. Um, I feel, I almost feel embarrassed not to have my license after spending five years in school and um, three years in the in the industry. Um, Beyond that, I don't really see a purpose if you have somebody that can stamp your drawings. I, unfortunately, on my little project, didn't realize at the time, but because I was above uh, two stories, I needed a stamp. And that took me a month, month and a half to find somebody that finally would stamp them um, after reviewing them, which is legal in California. If the, the art, I forget what the term is, but an architect can review your drawings and stamp them. Right, right. Now... And that that makes me think of, I mean, during that time where you're like, oh, man, now I wish I had my license. I mean, how sweet would that be just to be able to stamp them and, and move on? Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely think it's something I want to do. I think um, before I get my architectural license, I'll get my contractor's license. Um, as, as stupid as that may sound, it, um, it'll save a lot of money in insurance and workers' comp, et cetera, being a licensed contractor. Tell me about that. Why will that save insurance money? Um, ins insurances don't like to or don't like to insure a project of X dollar amount because um, an owner builder that's not a GC is a liability. So if you have your general contractor's license, um, they see it as less of a liability, and they'll insure you. So it opens up the doors to more insurance companies, whereas we're limited just a few. Very interesting. That's a very good tip because I have gotten some, there are, like you mentioned, it's difficult for architects to get insurance when they venture into the development world. So that's maybe a little tip that someone might be able to use, huh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I haven't taken it yet, but from what I understand, it's a, a study for a weekend and take the test program. So hopefully that's the case. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I took it uh, a couple of years ago. And yeah, compared to anything we do in school, I mean, you'll walk out of there with a big old smile on your face, I'm sure. So you're a licensed contractor then? Yeah, I have it I have it right now on, I forget what they call it, sort of inactive because I don't use uh -huh. it, you know. Yeah. But I definitely wanted to get it, and then I think there's just a, a small fee to reactivate it once I have a project yeah, I want to build. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been told by so many people get their contractor's license, and my dad and I have it at the top of our to-do list. It's just set aside, setting aside the time, so good for you. Excellent, excellent, Matt. That's a, that's a great tip. Now, any other any other words of wisdom before we end the segment about your current projects, about development and architects that that want to get into development? Things you've learned from working with Jonathan Siegel Architect. Um, I think the the most powerful thing that we have is the ability to change everything during construction. Um, for instance, we noticed that because our process is so accelerated, we don't we aren't able to pick up on everything. We aren't able to detail everything, um, and um, we realized that the bedrooms in our building were too small. I don't remember how we did it. I don't know if I was looking. I'm like, whoa, that's, that's too small. So we were able to actually extend the second floor um, a foot and make the bathrooms a foot smaller um, to accommodate a larger bedroom. So that's something that typically would be a big process, but I made one, phone, one call to the structural engineer. Hey, is this going to work? Yeah, it should work. No problem. Um, I adjusted one unit, and then Greg in our office, who's managing the project, adjusted all the units. Um, he's still finagling all the uh, elevations and sections, excuse me, et cetera. Um, but within a three-day period, we increased bedrooms by a foot each and reduced the bathroom by a foot uh, with a nominal nominal process. No paper pushing back and forth. No yeah. 
RFPs. It just it's a uh, it allows you to change things on the fly. Yeah, I mean that is golden. I think architects right now are just they're probably salivating hearing that because of all like you said the request for information that we get and then we have to turn around it turns into a change order. There's an add to the project. The owners throw up their arms and say where's all this money, you know, coming from and it just turns into well, architects look bad. Yeah, I mean, I do feel bad for some of the contractors when we're constantly changing things, but we've got some great people we work with, um, especially the framer, who's very accommodating. Good, good. Well, Matthew, thank you for joining us for this this episode of Business of Architecture, and I want to ask everyone to tune in to next week when Matthew's going to tell us about his project that he developed, the Fancy Lofts. So, Matthew, we'll catch up with you next week. Thank you. It's great talking to you. Yeah, great having you on the show. Well, that puts the lid on another show about the business of architecture. I really hope that you got something out of this show that can help you have more success and profit in the world of architecture. And if you want to join the discussion about this episode, you can find it on the podcast page on businessofarchitecture.com. And while you're there, feel free to share the show using the social media share links. If you sign up for the Business of Architecture Insider List, I'll send you other resources like the Architect Marketing Guide and information on how to use web tools to get more visibility for your firm and your work. expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts and I make no representation guarantee promise agreement affirmation pledge warranty contract bond commitment except to help architects conquer the world bump music credit to Ben Folds 5 do it anyway